Good evening, folks, and welcome to the live stream. I hope you're all very well this evening. We have a new format. Well, it's a newish format. I've tried it before. It didn't work out too well the, the last time, but trying it once again. I have a bit of a better internet connection this time, so giving it a go. So I hope everyone's very well, and you can see the hat is back. Uh, let's see who we have on tonight. We have Suzanne. Great to see you, Suzanne. Aki's Mad is here. We have Wim. Great to see you. Um, who else have we got? John O'Sullivan is here. Brad is here. Araman, great to see you. Frederick is on too. Great to see you once again. Uh, EJ AJ, great to see you. Hope you're well. Sam Priest. Um, have you heard the, the nonsense of Kimmy Badenoch and Ian Dale's show? Yes, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, Billy is here. Great to see you. Uh, who else have we got? Jason. Young Ralph is on. We have Ham. Chatty Rat, great to see you. Hope you're well. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, Mark is here. David McGuinness, make sure to check out Indie Truck Davies, the two Davies YouTube channel. Um, we have Stefan, great to see you. CGM, great to have you on. Thanks for moderating tonight. Hope you're well tonight. Mark Leslie is here. We also have... Um, who else have we got? Roisin, great to see you. 91 Leeds is here. Unquiet Spirit. Reagan Elite, hope you're well. Thanks for uh, sharing the live streams. Uh, I, I don't know if I shared it on Twitter today. I haven't been on Twitter very much. Um, make sure to check out Reagan Elite's YouTube channel uh, for more political stuff. Ronan is here. Uh, Alistair. Uh, Shell, good to see you. Who else? We've got Reg. And uh, Sven, the Arctic Fox. Great to see you. Hope you're all very well. You only two and so many more. Hope you're all very well. Hope you had a very nice weekend. And uh, you <laughs> were following what was happening in Brussels today. So we're going to cover a few things tonight. Um, what's happened with uh, the vote in Parliament on the smoking ban. Um, the government were able to get that through. It was a free vote, but thanks to the Labour Party, it got through. We're going to talk a bit about Rwanda, uh, Rishi Sunak, and of course what happened in Brussels today with... Um, you know, the, <laughs> the the mayor of Brussels, Brussels has taken back control, it seems, and uh, decided to kick out troublemakers. Anyway, let, let's start off with this story where uh, there was a vote in Parliament and a number of Conservatives, well, it was a free vote and a number of Conservatives voted against the government, high-profile ones. This is the division list of the vote on the smoking ban that we promised uh, to bring you earlier. Rishi Sunak, of course, giving Conservative MPs a free vote on the bill. Now we know who they are. Sky's chief political correspondent, John Craig, here with the details. Any names that jumped out to you? Oh, not half. <laughs> <laughs> a few, quite a few ministers, yes. Just to recap, 383 in favour, 67 against. Number of Conservatives, 57 plus two tellers, so that's 59. Big names? Well, Kemi Badenoch, le on the front, front first page, leaps out at you. She mentioned in a four-page tweet that you mentioned earlier on her reasons for that. Steve Baker, Northern Ireland Minister. Jake Berry, I mentioned earlier, who was very vocal in the during the debate. Graham Brady, the shop backbench shop steward, chairs the 22. Suella Braverman, a dash back from Brussels to vote against she made this. It. Yep. Um, Chris Chope, veteran uh, right winger. Simon Clark, trust ally. Brendan Clark Smith, uh, deputy chairman. Tories, Judridge, Johnson supporter, George Eustace, former cabinet minister, Marc Francois, right winger, Andrew Griffith, science minister, um, Jonathan Gullis, new deputy chairman of the Tory party, Robert Jenrick, mm. my goodness, that man will do anything to get support for his leadership <laughs> bid, won't he? Um, Edward Lee, veteran right winger, Julia Lopez, a minister, Rhys Mogg, predictable, I guess, Lawrence Robertson, veteran uh, right winger, I suppose you'd call him, Liz Truss, of course, who spoke during the debate. Giles Watling, the former actor, uh, was talking, uh, spoke during the debate. And then you've got some DUP. Uh, you've got Lee Anderson now of Reform UK and George Galloway. George <laughs> used to smoke cigars, I remember. And I remember when I covered the Rochdale by-election, I think he told me he'd given up the cigars now. George Galloway is a bit of a shock. OK, and of course, the DUP, the DUP vote with the Conservatives because the DUP like kissing the arse of the Tories. Um... Now, the big name there, of course, being one of them being Liz Truss and the other being Kemi Badenoch. And, uh, and uh, look, let's get to this clip where Kemi Badenoch was interviewed about her vote and about the smoking ban. Look, this is nothing to do with smoking. This is about 
politicians trying to make a name for themselves, trying to say, look, I'm different. I'm a real conservative. I care about personal freedoms, you know, when they're the same people who will vote to ban protests. But let's start off with the reason that you voted against your own government. I know it's a free vote. Mm -hmm. It's quite something to do for a cabinet minister to vote against the, the, the party line on that, isn't it? Um, well, a free vote is different from a party line, uh, in my view. And I thought very long and hard about it. I would rather not um, have voted against. But I thought, actually, a free vote gives you an opportunity to step outside collective responsibility and explain some of your thinking. And you know, I went through multiple iterations of of which way to vote because my, my father died of cancer and we believe that it was uh, a lung cancer that actually spread to, to his brain. So I think it's important that people understand that I'm not a supporter of smoking. I don't like it. Um, I've never been a smoker and I can see the damage that it does. I want to see that smoke-free generation. But how uh, we draft legislation and the approach we take is just as important as the intentions. You know that phrase, the road to hell is uh, paved with good intentions. It applies to so many uh, so many areas of policy where we allow the, the thing we want to do to justify the means, but I don't think the end justifies the means. I think we need to think about the means as well. And the principle really that uh, I was most against was uh, equality under the law and treating adults differently. Uh, creating a law which would mean that a 50-year-old could do something but a 49-year-old couldn't and how that would be enforced, it didn't feel, it didn't feel right to me. So I voted against it just on, on that principle mainly. Did you come under pressure? From okay, I don't believe for a second that's the reason she voted against it. She was like, oh, what way can I excuse? This is about her positioning herself once again to be leader of the Conservative Party like Liz Truss as well. These people don't care about smoking. They don't care about bans. They don't care about public health. They don't care about any of these things. It's Maybe I'm overly cynical, but I believe that it, because it was a free vote, they voted uh, this way to boost their image. But there was an opportunity to stand out from the crowd, and they did that. That's what it's about. And it's quite shameful in a way because she, first of all, introduced about how her father died of cancer. And... You know, somebody who went through something like that would, you would, you would imagine would say, okay, we need to to ban this. This is there's no reason to keep this thing illegal, keep this thing legal. Uh, but to to have it say, well, you know, somebody could be treated differently because of their age. I, I don't buy that for a second. Uh, Jus Bannock is condescendingly arrogant, isn't? Um, is she not? Just listen to her voice. Um, and Killer is on the stream. Great to see you, Killer. Hope you're well tonight. Uh, thanks for moderating. Um, she got a big, big brown envelope from the tobacco companies. <laughs> yeah, certainly it's 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 looking something like that. Although I, I don't know if you know they they already have their right wing think tanks in their pockets, so there's no need to to reach out to politicians as well. The poli the, the politicians are already spoon fed. Their talking points uh, by the right-wing think tanks, like you know those on Tufton Street, who are paid for by the uh, by the tobacco and oil and fossil fuel industry. Anyway, let's move on. This is an interesting poll that's been published just uh, uh, recently. Uh, I think it was actually today. It says here uh, Richard Parker leads Andy Street by fourteen percent. Um, West Midlands mayoral election. Uh, and here is the polling. You can see here uh, Richard Parker. Don't know who this guy is, but he's leading Andy Street. Now, Andy Street is presented as a sort of uh, standard bearer for the Conservatives. You know, they weren't expect he wasn't expecting to win his uh, mayoral seat the last time around, and um, he he was a, a bit of a surprise. And uh, and now it seems that there's going to be a case that he's going to like if we look at this polling. He's going to lose his seat. And this is going to be a massive hit for the Conservatives. So, you know, a lot of the focus is on the local elections, the council seats. Uh, but losing Andy Street is going to be a massive hit for the Conservatives because he's, I think he's a sort of canary in the, in the coal mine sense that if they're losing big people like this, it's going to be pretty bad for the general election. Because generally the mayor... And he was, for a while, he was quite popular, but it seems he's going to be swept away in this massive backlash against the Conservatives. So whether he's locally po popular or not, well, it doesn't seem to make any difference. It seems he's going to be out on his ear. Um, 
And I think it was uh, Jonathan Gullis <laughs> who retweeted this and says, look, if uh, if Reform UK vote switches to Conservatives, then Andy can hold on. But like that's not the way <laughs> it would work. First of all, even if all of the votes switched from Reform to Andy Street, it, would, it still wouldn't be enough. Labour would still win. But... Um, uh, because um, I think with the percent, the the maybe it was the it was the vote count, not the percent. I don't remember. It wasn't wasn't the, it was actually the vote count, not percentage. But um, uh, it's it's a case of the, look, you, not not everyone who votes uh, reform is going to vote conservative. If reform to step down, a lot of them would have um, would go to uh, labor anyway. Um, Lee, thank you so much. That's your job. Hi, Max. Uh, Love to you and yours. Thank you. It's very, very kind of you for that support. Um, just want to cover some other things uh, that popped up here. Uh, streeting, it's thanks to Labour, the smoking ban passed. And this is West Streeting, the shadow uh, health secretary. After the government bill, uh, after the government's bill to stop young people ever smoking passed its hurdle, uh, its first hurdle in the House of Commons, Labour's shadow health secretary spoke to broadcasters with his party's view. West Streeting said Labour has led the debate on phasing out smoking in our country and makes sure this generation of children and young people grow up in a smoke-free Britain. Um, yeah, it, it was thanks to the Labour Party that the vote crossed. They, you know, if if, um, if it had come down to just just to the Conservatives. Rishi Sunak wouldn't have had enough support. And of course, Rishi Sunak is not going to come out and thank <laughs> Labour for helping the government here. Um, later, it says he pledged that Labour would implement the ban if it forms the next government. Mr. Streeting uh, also said the government has been slow to act on the explosion in the number of young people and children vaping, uh, which he said will, will have serious consequences for the health Um and also the, their education as children are skipping school to go and vape. I'm not familiar with with the, the numbers when it comes to vaping, um, but it seems to be a growing problem. Uh, Ninja, thank you so much, Ninja. Remember, folks, uh, a lettuce outlived Liz Truss as Prime Minister uh, says all you need to know about her popularity. Yes, and she thinks that she can come back and be as popular as before. She, she honestly, been, I think... The problem with Liz Truss is that she surrounds herself with people who just tell her what she wants to hear. Or even worse than that, she doesn't actually have a functioning brain. She's just an empty vessel. And they say, we, we want you to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. We want you to be the next prime minister. And she's, yeah, OK, I'll do that. <laughs> she's like just, you know, like a puppet, a puppet on a string. Um, Rwandan enforcement officers told to leave is cancelled as government hopes law will pass. Immigration uh, enforcement staff have been had their leave cancelled as the government hopes its its plan to send uh, some asylum seekers to Rwanda will become law this week. Speaking to Sky News, Lucy Morton from the ISU, the Union for Borders, Immigration and Customs, said the staff who would be expected to arrest and remove people still know very little about how they will be expected to force people onto planes. What planes? <laughs> Uh, she said immigration enforcement officers have had their leave cancelled for six weeks beginning the week after next. Initially, it had been told uh, leave was, was cancelled from next week, but it has been delayed. Look, God, once again, this is, I think, just for show. Yeah, we're actually going to do something. Empty vessel, Max. Um it's um this is all just for show yeah we're going to do something we're going to send people to rwanda but don't ask us about aircraft don't ask us about flights because well <laughs> sir larry uh, per per peruvian lads <laughs> uh, i heard les dross on the radio has uh, this morning saying she likes the taylor swift song blank space <laughs> oh um did I miss a super chat? Apologies if I did. No, I'm going all the way up. I don't see anything. Anyway, um, any other stories here that pop out? Um, Sonak should remove the whip from Braverman over NatCon conference, Labour Front Bencher. So let's get let's jump into that story. Hello, is it Suala Braverman was one of the keynote speakers? 
And I had a very quick glance at the roster of other speakers at this event today, and you've got people who are pretty unsavoury, very hardline extremist characters, people who have criticised uh, equal marriage, for example, people who have been involved with white supremacist organisations, one individual who appears to be justifying the uh, action of the Christchurch uh, uh, shooter. Why is Suella Braverman palling around with these very hardline extremist people? And why isn't Rishi Sunak stepping in to do something about it? Because he's spineless, because he's too afraid, because he knows that if he, did, if he does anything, it will it result in him being brought down. She will organize her sycophants to do something about it. That's why he's not doing anything about it. Um, if Braverman and Farage had a love child, <laughs> they'd make Putin look like a cat. <laughs> Please don't put these images in our minds. He's so weak, he should have blocked her from going. Or we should perhaps even think about taking the whip off her. You know, it feels like Labour is keen to criticise some of the speakers at the event. You know, what you've just done there, uh, West Druti again saying it was an event in the Commons full of far-right fanatics. You might not like the views of everyone at the event, but there are people who will be listening to this who support Suella Braverman, who support Nigel Farage. And don't they have the right to, to speak, to be heard? Yeah, but Suella Braverman is a Conservative Party politician, a backbencher... And, a, and the Conservatives are in government. My, my, my question, speaking... though, is about whether the police were right to shut down the event. Well, I mean, that, I mean look, that's for the, the, the authorities in Brussels. It's a what different, do you think, It's though? a different country. It's a different country. I, I, it, you know, that event... What, what, it limits of free speech. This is really dropping the ball here from Sky News. It's nothing to do with free speech. It's about public safety. Do you want people like Nigel Farage and Suella Braveman in town? Like, Suella Braveman, when she was Home Secretary, was trying to ban people from protesting. She said that the protests were hate marches, and she wanted them banned. She wanted people put in prison for going on a march. Now, whether she was able to, whether she, well, she didn't actually get through, she wasn't able to succeed in pushing this through, but her plan was to, uh, to stop people from marching and put them in prison. Like, this... I presume that the mayor of, uh, of Brussels saw this as, as a security threat. And, so, and under public safety, you can ban things like this. Would have gone ahead. But, but you know, if Nigel Farage and Suella Braveman had such a problem with this, well, then why don't they take their, core, their case to the European Court of Human Rights? <laughs> In this country, it did, I think, last year. But look at the other speakers. People who are justifying uh, people who have take, carried out terrorist acts, people who have... Uh, been Can you imagine if members of the Labour Party were attending like Hamas rallies or something like this? What do you think the media would be saying? What do you think the Conservative Party would be saying? Associated with white supremacist organisations, uh, politicians who have criticised in the most graphic terms uh, equal marriage. Why is Suala Braverman allowed by Rishi Sunak to associate herself with these hard right extremist dangerous individuals. So what do, you think, that, what do you think he should do? He should have stopped. With, well, well first of all, withdraw he, the whip? I actually wrote to him over the weekend and raised this, I think, in one of the newspapers over the weekend, saying he should have blocked her from going. He obviously didn't. So he perhaps he should be looking at withdrawing the whip because she shouldn't be associated with these people. Uh, these are. Of course she sh Well, she will because she loves these people and these people love her. That's why she's there. But it's also about pr boosting her profile a bit like Kemi Badenoch. So it's about how can I boost my profile? I want to be perhaps the next leader of the Conservative Party in opposition. So this is a great way of doing it. A bit of extra publicity. And Nigel Farage is there. That's wonderful. He he'll lend me some publicity as well. These views are way outside of the mainstream of British opinion. These are dangerous extremist views. And in many ways, this is the future of the Tory party, isn't it? This is where the Tory party is heading. And Rishi Sunak is too weak to do anything about it. And he's completely correct. This is the way, this is the future of the Conservative Party. Because I've said before, what will happen at the general election is um, it's looking more and more likely that, uh, that Rishi Sunak will lead the Conservative Party to defeat. And then the headbangers, the crazy people, will turn around and say, ah, oh, see, we lost because we weren't conservative enough. We weren't far right enough. We weren't as close as possible to reform UK. And... 
whoever takes and of course they'll say what we need is a new leader who's a true conservative and who's a true conservative well Suella Braverman's a, a true conservative or Kemi Badenoch or Liz Truss or some other person like that and that's what they're going to do they're going to put some crazy person in charge they're not going to put a moderate in charge because they're going to say well we lost because we were going with moderates uh, we'll have to go far right and that is the future of the Conservative Party. You know, like, Nigel Farage was invited to an alternative, what do you call it, alternative, der, per, uh, was it alternative for Deutschland, the far-right party in Germany. He was invited to speak at one of their events. He's He's been very pally with far-right individuals in Italy, in, in other parts of Europe. So, you know, if you're... If you're sharing a stage with Nigel Farage and you're talking about immigration and you're agreeing with the things he's saying and he's agreeing with people like Orban, he's, he's agreeing with people like um, the extremists in Germany. I don't know. What, what does that say about you and your party? And if you're going to be the next leader, what does that say about the future of the Conservative Party? So we'll have to cover this story, of course, Nigel Farage having his uh, love fest cancelled. As you can see, or I'm just about inside uh, this venue. Uh, there are upwards of maybe a dozen uh, police officers effectively blocking anyone from entering uh, the building. And indeed, if I were to leave, I wouldn't be allowed to re-enter. That's essentially the situation we're on. They're effectively trying to strangle the conference, if you like, by ensuring that uh, the delegates that are effectively in here, when they leave, they won't simply be allowed to uh, return. Now, the reason, as you've seen, that the mayor has made that clear. He thinks there's concerns around public orders offences, also concerned about the people who are at this event. But frankly, the conference is still taking place. There are uh, dozens of people uh, behind me. There are people inside the hall. Speeches are uh, continuing. And the organisers have suggested that tomorrow they will find another venue in Brussels to carry on this conference. Now, unsurprisingly, this has provoked uh, quite a lot of reaction here. And of course, this look, the, the good side of this is that Nigel Farage and Braverman and, 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 and others like her and him have been, um, you know, their, their attempts to, to broadcast their hatred has been cancelled in a sense has been shut down and um, the mayor of brussels has taken back control he said look we don't want these uh, troublemaking foreigners in our country which is of course quite ironic that nigel farage and uh, suella braverman have gone to brussels to criticize immigration um criticize foreigners but the other side the flip side of the coin of course is that they'll use this as a platform to say see they're trying to stop us from speaking. Look, we're not. We're, our freedom of expression has been taken away. Um, they want to. They want to suppress our freedom of, of speech. This is what it's all about. And of course, Farage and others will try and take advantage of the situation. And you know, this plays into him, but into his uh, into his hands. But on the other side, you know, are we supposed to just give them a platform? Are we supposed to allow them to amplify themselves? You know. We need to debate these things. We need to challenge these things. Um, of course, you know, this NAT conservative, C, whatever, <laughs> conference, it wasn't about debate. It was about pushing a narrative. And there was no, no one on the other side to challenge them. It was just them you know, speaking within an echo chamber. Um, but, you know, why doesn't he stay in his own country? Why is he going to Brussels to share, you know, to spread his hate? Um, Freka Pony, thank you so much for that super chat. You know what's sad, Max? Those uh, who Braverman, Braver, <laughs> Braverman uh, now associate would 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 not, uh, would ordinarily not piss on her um, if she suddenly combusted, self combusted. Yes, you know, does does she and others and Kemi Badenoch not understand that if they were you know in another t in another part of town and they were not known, they would be in a very dangerous situation because of the skin, the color of their skin, because of their ethnic background. So they're associating with people who would happily see them put in a very difficult situation and to hell with the consequences. So, you know, you'd be very careful of who you associate with because it could come back to, to bite you on the arse. We've seen it before. Um, anyway, let, let's let's move on away from Farage and, and and all of that. The Rwanda bill. 
so it seems as we talked about at the beginning of the show um the rwanda bill is uh going back and forth between the house of commons and the house of lords and um well it seems that the border force or whoever's in charge of immigration is being told look cancel your leave you're going to be sending people to rwanda do we have aircraft no but that's not important um rishi sunak's a uh, rwanda plan defeated in lords again forcing mps to consider four changes um new uh, new defeats for the government's rwanda bill in the house of lords have been have been set uh, have set up a parliamentary showdown on wednesday forcing forcing mps uh, to consider changes to Rishi Sunak's Stop the Boats plan. Downing Street wants the wants to get the bill which declares Rwanda a safe country and stops appeals from asylum seekers being sent there on safety grounds on the statute books this week. On Monday, so it's likely to get through because he has the numbers. On Monday, the House of Commons stripped seven amendments from the bill previously imposed by the Lords. It then debated again today. Um, but the new amendments being added once again by peers, the Commons uh, will need to debate these changes and vote on them on Wednesday, when the ha- when the Lords sitting later in the evening to consider whether to implement further amendments. The government had hoped had been hoping to get the bill passed on Wednesday, but this depends on parliamentary arithmetic and whether peers uh, propose more changes. So you know, if a number of peers decide, look, there's no point resisting this; we'll just let it go through, then it will become law but once again this idea that you can through legislation deem <laughs> rwanda a safe country is nonsensical but even if it was deemed a safe country how are you going to send asylum seekers there where well, there's no aircraft and even if you did have aircraft where are they going to stay because rwanda has sold off a lot of the properties so and Rwanda has said, of course, we're, we're not going to take unlimited numbers, something like 400 people per year. But I think what Rishi Sunak needs is some symbolic um, demonstration. He just needs to show that he's sending some people. So I, 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 I would imagine that they'll do is they'll charter some aircraft. They'll buy some aircraft. I'm, I'm really surprised a Tory uh, donor hasn't stepped forward and said, look, give me a massive contract and I'll send people to Rwanda for you. <laughs> I'm really surprised. You know, Michelle Moan hasn't been approached. You know, she could use her yacht or something to get people. Can Maybe that would be a bit difficult, <laughs> getting people to Rwanda in a yacht. But I'm sure they could, you know, charter a flight or, you know, buy some aircraft or something from some dodgy Tory donor. I'm surprised they haven't tried that. Or maybe they already did. But even the Tory donors are like, no, 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 we don't want anything to do with this. This is too, this is too beyond the pale, even for us. Um, we, you know, it's, um, we have, you know, we, we don't have much of a reputation, but we have something that we, we need to protect. Um, let me read some of your comments, guys, because I seem to ramble on a bit there. Belgium taking back control. Uh, worse in America, Trump takes uh, president of the U.S., uh, again and civil war won't just be a movie um is that is is this the nazi side <laughs> yes um platform f- platform of crimey <laughs> friggin river uh deform uk remember to hit the like button folks yes do please do it helps the live stream uh larry uh, maybe nuremberg was fully booked <laughs> Um, they've robbed st- uh, satirists of uh, a load of material. Yes, it is becoming more and more difficult. Um, hello, YouTube has been recommending you a lot. Enjoying the content. Thank you very much, Alberito. I love, I love the name Alberito. Muchas gracias. Um, Four hundred sixty-seven in chat. One hundred thirty-eight likes. Come on, guys, smash the like button. I thought Nigel was going to leave. The UK and never come back. Yeah, this is something that Nigel Farage said in the during the Brexit vote. He said, "Look, if Brexit didn't go well, I would leave the country." He actually came out and said, "Brexit is not going so well," but he's still in Britain. He's now in Belgium, I think. But may he may he may have returned. Um, he should be denied, you know, entry. You you want to you want to go to Belgium and stay there? If he got uh, if he got paid for the speech, he would like he would have needed a professional visa. I'm sure he had uh, he had none uh, they should deport him and bar him from schengen <laughs> yes that would be lovely to see along with suella braverman 
Uh, I deport Leaky Sue and Grafter Farage to Rwanda. Well, they keep saying it's a wonderful place, so I don't know why. Surely they wouldn't have a problem going there. Um, dear Nigel and Co, we're dropping you a hint. Regards from the European Union. And Farage tried to turn it into an EU issue. It's nothing to do with the EU. It's the mayor of Brussels who said, look, I don't want, you know, troublemakers in my town. Like he took back control. Especially foreign troublemakers, you know, the, the, using, a, using Farage and Suella Braverman's own language. Is a national conservatism the opposite of national socialism? In which case does it make it communism? I'm confused. Me too. Michelle Moon could uh, ship a few migrants on her new yacht. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure how far she'd get, though, but, you know, at least some of the way. Um, and of course, once again, I, I don't understand why the conservatives haven't just bought a plane and put it on taxpayer expenses to send people to, to Rwanda. But maybe they will. Anyway, let's uh, take a short comedy moment and we'll be back in just a jiffy with more serious stuff. Hope you enjoy this. Welcome to Broken News. The British public and people the world over have been urged to forgive Prince Andrew. The eighth in line to the British throne has faced years of criticism from some who've called him a condescendingly pompous waste of space with no discernible talent, a dead-eyed jowly ball bag who repeatedly rinsed the royal purse with his love of lavish international fuck parties, and a humourless gibbon who claims he slipped and accidentally fell into a child sex trafficking ring with his pants down. Our reporter has more. The favourite son of Queen Elizabeth II has faced a barrage of abuse over the years. But now the Prince Andrew Exoneration Development Office, which has been set up specifically to reintroduce Andrew to royal duties, says, come on, who among us hasn't been bezies with a billionaire sex trafficker or invited Harvey Weinstein to their teenage daughter's birthday party? Critics claim that if he was literally anyone else, the Duke of Pork and high-born clammy manatee might have actually had to go to court after no fewer than three allegations of sexual assault. Mercifully, he got the cash money from Mumsy to avoid that inconvenience so that he could get back to doing what he does best, which is... But it'll take some work to convince the plebs that he's fit for a return to public life. Recent polling consistently shows Prince Andrew to be the least popular royal, even less popular than Prince Edward, a fictional member of a royal family who no one's actually ever seen in real life. Buckingham Palace will be keen not to shoulder any more embarrassment for the man whose wife left him because she didn't like the way he sucked her toes. They added, while it is true that Prince Andrew reached a multi-million pound settlement with a woman he definitely didn't do anything bad on top of or in, at least he didn't meet and then marry the love of his life, an already successful, fiercely independent and achingly beautiful American actor, because that would be totally fucking unforgivable. Back to you. What a lovely story. That's all from Broken News. You're up to date. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's move on. Um, uh, let's start with this instead. In the press today, the business secretary is the latest to let it be known that she will be opposing this bill. Journalists were helpfully pointed towards comments about her belief in the limits of the state made during her last leadership campaign. I say her last leadership campaign, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm sure it won't be her last leadership <laughs> campaign indeed. I don't think it ever stopped. But anyway, uh, th that's what she said. She, in fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, bemoaned governments who try to solve every problem. Well, if she has a problem with government solving problems, she must be delighted with the record of this government. They can barely <laughs> solve any problems. They can't even solve the chaos in their own party. But of course... She and that's, of course, about Kemi Badenoch and uh, Liz Truss. So Sunak putting international diplomacy before appeasement of frustrated backbenchers. 
So Rishi Sunak uh, to Keir Star from, Keir, from sorry from Rishi Sunak to Keir Starmer to pre, to President Macron and Joe, um, President Biden. Western leaders on Monday appealed to Israel to exercise restraint following Iran's uh, drone and missile attack. The Prime Minister addressing MPs issued a carefully worded statement that both reiterated unwavering support for Israel while acknowledging the other regional partners, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, who helped in efforts to intercept and destroy almost all of the projectiles fired by, uh, by Iran and its proxies on Saturday. With all eyes on Israel... Allies are publicly coordinating with the Prime Minister on Monday, was carefully not was careful not to go beyond clearly agreeing uh, lines to take a lot among allies. Look, I'm really concerned about this because what you have a situation is where it seems that Benjamin Netanyahu is going rogue. He's pushing the envelope. He's constantly pushing the envelope. He's constantly going to extremes. And Western allies are constantly having to jump through hoops to defend this like t- if you think about what what did what did benjamin Netanyahu and the idf do recently they they destroyed an embassy in damascus they deliberately targeted um that building which is is illegal under international law it's you know it's it's, it's a breach of another country's sovereignty and there was no criticism of that. It was like, well, you probably shouldn't have done that. That was that's about as much of the criticism it received. And then, how did Iran respond? Well, they sent three hundred odd missiles and drones and all sorts of things all the way over. Um, of course, it, it seemed that you know they had given a sort of warning ahead of time. Said, look, we're sending drones. It's going to take a few hours for them to get there. So, of course. It seems that it was more for public show in Iran. It was not really an attempt to do any damage to Israel. Um, you know, or it was maybe at most a test of the Iron Drone, Iron Dome, Iron Dome. Sorry, uh, defense mechanism, defense shield, uh, which successfully, pretty like ninety nine percent of the, I think it was an over ninety, almost ninety nine percent of the missiles were intercepted. So it was not really a threat to Israel. And a lot of them were also taken down by the U.S. and British aircraft. But, like, what does Netanyahu have to do for the U.K. or the U.S. to say, wait a minute, stop that now? Because what he's doing in Gaza is not receiving significant condemnation by the British or the U.S., uh, US British government or the U.S. government, and attacking an embassy in another country you know, which was condemned by, you know, most countries, um, that's not enough either. Like, what will he have to do? Of course, he's doing these things because he wants to prolong this war, Netanyahu, because he, if he knows that as soon as this ends, he'll be in prison probably over issues of, I believe, corruption and attempts to undermine democracy in his own country. Um, the rule of law, for example. Uh, there was a warning... Uh, that was a warning to test their defenses. Uh, it's coming uh, to that, Stephen Ball. Um, uh, is there a Goldilocks zone? Not too hot, not too cold, just right like England. Uh, Iran had the right to defend itself and respond to Israel's attack in Syria. Like that, that has been, you know, the response has been, well, Israel had the right to defend itself. Israel has the right to defend itself, then then every nation has a right to defend itself. Because even David Cameron said, well, they had the right to respond, but the response was not right. <laughs> okay. So he, but he didn't define what the response what a, a correct response would have been. Like how were they supposed to respond? To recall the diplomat? Uh, do they have do does Iran have an embl- embassy in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem? I don't think so. Um or is there an Israeli ambassador in uh, Tehran? I don't think so. <laughs> um, do they have a diplomatic mission there? I don't think so. But even if they were, would that be sufficient? Like, you know, think about it for a moment. Can you imagine if if Iran said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to destroy one of Israel's embassies in um, in a country that's not friendly to us, which could be like the US or in London. Can you imagine if Iran said, we're, we're going to target the Israeli um, uh, embassy in London. W- would the British government say, well, that's okay. 
<laughs> would they say, well, that, you know, that's that's uh, that's uh, pretty much, you know, even for even. No, I think they would respond in a very direct way. They'd say, no, this is completely unacceptable. Um, the amount of treasury... The amount of treasury we'll lose on tobacco and smoking-related par- paraphernalia will be in the billions. This alone will make us make me suspicious of the latest Tory disaster. Yeah, this is. I never understood what this. Uh, this. Yeah, we'll get back to the smoking ban because I never understood what this was about. What's the political benefit here for Rishi Sunak? Like he's on the way out, and you know the, the Conservative Party are generally supporter supported by the tobacco industry so i really don't understand what their what the benefit is is here it's not it can't be public health because they don't care about the public um what's what's driving rishi sunak and the tories ambitions here i don't get it unless it's like we need to ban something so let's ban something let's show that we're doing something that doesn't actually cost us money it, it, in a sense it's not costing the, the government money directly immediately it will result in lost revenue of course so they can fi- they'll have to find it somewhere else unless this is and maybe i'm being overly cynical here because i can be overly cynical i think from time to time but it, i unless it's an attempt to undermine the labor government the future labor government ah look we're going to cut off a stream of cash to them maybe that's it i don't know maybe i'm just being he's just being an arse <laughs> <laughs> you know, Occam's razor. You know, he just cut out the, the the complex stuff and just go straight to the the easy stuff. You know, the the simplest response is normally the the correct one. <laughs> it's just been an arse. <laughs> um, talking about smoking whilst ignoring real issues, a smoke screen. <laughs> no pun intended there. I hope, Michael. Uh, yeah, it, it could. As I said in in on other occasions, when they ban something, it's because it's cheap. And because it's immediate and because it grabs attention while you know investing in infrastructure takes time and it, and it takes a lot of money and you know there are it's complicated um investing in the nhs that's not going to result in massive support for the conservatives and you know if, you, if you're a tory donor who wants to uh, privatize the nhs you don't want to see money going into the public sector you want to you want to see it going into the private sector so yeah it's Things that would actually help people immediately um, in a big way, well, you don't want to do that. You just want to have some sort of gimmick. And it does sound more like a gimmick than an actual an actual real policy. Um, anyway, let's let's move on. Um, Liz Truss, is, why, why has Liz Truss not gone away, disappeared? You know, why... I, I said before she should have had the, the whip removed and... Um, and just disappeared from politics altogether. But no, she somehow is like some sort of you know, thing in the toilet that does not flush away. And my real fear is that this is not the final stage that the health police want to push. The health police. <laughs> they are the health police. They are the health police. They want to be able to make their own decisions about what they eat, what they drink, and how they enjoy themselves. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm not speaking this debate today because I love smoking, although I have voted. Do you notice how her accent changes all the time? So at the beginning, she sounds a bit like Thatcher, or she tries to sound like Thatcher, and then it sort of wanes away. It sort of she st- she loses it, and she goes back to her normal way of speaking. <sighs> Against every single smoking prohibition since I've been a member of Parliament, the reason I am speaking today is I am very concerned that this policy putting put, being put forward is emblematic of a technocratic establishment in this country. She's, of course, regurgitating Tufton Street pro-tobacco talking points, of course. Um, Brad, thank you so much for that super chat. Given all these public... Uh, I Sorry, given all these uh, ironic scandals, Truss's downfall will will probably come from a body scandal. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't want to know who's involved in that as well. <laughs> Thanks for that super chat, I think. <laughs> that wants to limit people's freedom. 
And I think... Look, stop talking about people's freedom because you're one of them MPs who voted to, to ban people from protesting. Okay, and your response was, well, we need to ban people from protesting because it's noisy. Wasn't there a bill that they were trying to push? I don't know whether they actually got through. Well, I think they actually got it through Parliament. Was the, the anti-Steve Bray bill. Because Steve Bray was playing his, uh, his amplifiers outside Parliament and they decided we can't have any more of this because he's embarrassing us. So may, let's introduce a bill to stop Steve Bray from playing his music or his uh, amplifiers anywhere near Parliament. So he was moved. And any time he tries to get near Parliament Square, he's uh, moved along by the police. You know, the police who are supposed to be investigating real crimes. That is a problem. <laughs> I will not give way to the Honourable Lady. I will not give way. I'll give away exactly as much opportunity as the opposition gave me to talk about my private members bill. Oh. Oh my goodness! Okay, and then she goes on about how well you know. My, I had my primary. So it's, this is the problem with Parliament as well. Why? Why? Why are MPs not given a, spe a specific amount of time to speak, and then the speaker says, "Okay, your time is up. Have it on a clock." So this is amount. This is the amount of time you can speak, and not allow people just to. I'm not going to give way. I'm not going to give way. You, sh you shouldn't be allowed to do this. Um, Dufton Street don't um, strategize for. Um, for school lunches no exactly anyway guys let's let's move on from this because it's it's embarrassing um there's a few other stories i wanted and let me read more of your comments because uh, you guys make the stream have a cigar um we heard about the the sellout vocals ray harper um she used to have two hands about <laughs> now now only one what's the other hand uh we can't see is it? Is this AI? <laughs> uh, the lettuce needs to be turned into a chopped salad. <laughs> uh, she, she gets asked about the hard drugs and brushes it aside. But I wish uh, they'd ask her about about cannabis, which uh, which would be a harder question to ignore, going by her her own logic. Um. She's on prescript, prescripted drugs, allegedly, American ones. She sounds, she always comes across, or not always, but recently she comes across as a bit sort of dazed, as if she's on some sort of very powerful medication. It could also be she's just drunk, I don't know. Um, Gordon Mack, um, has she had a stroke? Uh, still getting used to this being your face. <laughs> Sorry. I, I did get rid of the beard for a bit. But then um, ask anyone who has a beard. They'll tell you. That it, people with beards have something to hide. It's normally a double chin. <laughs> um, Liz is now preparing the British public for f um, food meat. <laughs> so, <laughs> which wouldn't be allowed into the EU. Yes. It, it was interesting. That there was um, a video I uploaded about her talking about the EU, and she said, you know, why she voted, why she campaigned for the UK to remain in the European Union, and she said, well, I had to pick a side. I was like, what the f? I had to pick a side, so I flipped a coin, and it landed on remain in the European Union. So I campaigned to remain in, in the European Union, or I looked around and I saw, well. Most of the other Tories are campaigning to li remain in the European Union, so I'll go along with them. It seems that was her, her thinking, if you can call it thinking, which was really strange because if you look at some of her videos from um, 2015, 2016, she made very valid points. But it could also be the case that she was surrounding herself with people who were making valid points and she was just copying those points. So she didn't actually have a position of her own. And I think that's Liz Trust to a T. She doesn't actually have a position that she believes in. Imagine what her family think. What do her children say to her? Like, why are you saying these things? I'm saying them because, well, the Tufton Street people told me to say it. Okay, but do you, like, do you have a functioning mind? Yourself? Do you actually have a position on anything? No, I don't have a position on anything. I'm a bit like Boris Johnson. Even worse. Because, as I said before, Boris Johnson... He was a bit of a liberal Tory, okay? Um, I would say he was a bit more, you know, more centrist 
then you know he, of course he he realized well the way brexit was going and he he realized well i be I need to be we need to be tough on immigration but he 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 doesn't come across yes he's made some horrible comments in the past about foreigners about gay people about um you know women uh, muslim women and stuff but i think I, I I think deep down he's somewhat of a centrist. He's not a Nigel Farage, and um, and I think when it came to Brexit, he was like, okay, if I want to further my career, I have to become a Brexiteer. Not that I believe in any of this. I just regurgitate. I say, okay, this is what I have to say. Tell me what I'm supposed to say, and I'll say it. That's what that's what Farage is all. About. Uh, sorry, Boris Johnson is all about. And I think. Um, Liz Truss saw that and saw, well, Johnson is really successful. He talks absolute tripe. He can lie through his teeth. I'll do that. It worked for him. Maybe it'll work for me. And what I'll do is I'll add a bit of gloss, and my gloss will be uh, Margaret fucking Thatcher. <laughs> um, and that will help. That you know, People, you know, the Tories loved Margaret Thatcher. What I'll do is I'll dress like her. I'll wear her hair. I'll talk like her. But... She doesn't understand why the Tories liked Thatcher, because they thought of her as authentic. Like you're not Margaret Thatcher. How can you, like, geez, like when you think about it, it just makes no sense whatsoever. If people liked somebody because they were, they believed them to be authentic, whether Margaret Thatcher was authentic or not is another thing. But if people believed her to be authentic, why would you try and copy that? Because you're, but you're not copying the idea of being authentic, you're trying to copy the person <laughs> who was being respected for being authentic. It's just insane leveled upon insane. It makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, my mother took me to took me on protest. Yes, I remember that as well. That was one of her, her lines. Um, Boja was only good at cleaning hospital chairs. <laughs> Good, good, you say. I don't know. If, I don't have "good" is the word. <laughs> Let me try and read the comment, Mark. Um, Bush was only good at cleaning hospital seats, and he believed himself overly viral. <laughs> Couldn't afford any should maintenance increase. <laughs> How many kids does he have that he knows of? It must be a terrible day. Uh, for, it must be terrible when he when he has to remember birthdays. Um, name the people she put in the House of Lords, and then you you'll discover who she really is. Yes, so it was wasn't it the was I don't know if he was meant to be sent to the House of Lords or he was just given some sort of honor. Was it the head of the um, the IEA, uh, Mark something? I forget what his name is. Um, politicians were uh, filling out survey relationship with truth, care for the community, etc. Check the box. It's complicated. Yes. Muppets are great. Oh, we're almost at the end of stream, guys. So I just want to cover uh, one final story before we go. Uh, a shorter stream tonight. A lot of the Farage stuff sort of... And I think the Farage stuff is going to run for a bit. But um, it means that, you know, Farage is trying to claim victim status once again. Anyway... This is a story that is not getting a lot of traction, unfortunately, but it should be because if we, um, Greenpeace calls uh, for government to reduce plastic production by 75% by 2040. Uh, Johnson is very pro-life, wink, wink. <laughs> yes. The means to uh, to, to bring... He, he was really pro-children making them. <laughs> that's what he's about. Thanks so much, Brad. Mark Littlewood, that's the guy. Into two million Londoners recycling bins ends up at this waste facility in Southwark. A lot of it's plastic, but perhaps more than you'd think. Campaign group Greenpeace asked volunteers to count the plastic going into their bins. It found an estimated 1.7 billion pieces get chucked each week, equating to 90 billion pieces a year. According to the recyclers, consumers aren't the problem. Regulations and taxes on plastic producers need to be tougher. I've been saying this for a long time. I said, look, one thing is putting pressure on the public to do their bit. But the, re the real problem stems from in industry. It needs, it, if industry change, it means there's less pressure on people to do the right thing. And, you know, one thing, a lot of the campaigning is about people having to separate their rubbish or recycle or reuse or whatever. But the real culprit 
is, of course, um, industry itself. And the government, with a stroke of a pen, can say, okay, industry, you have to do this. You have to reduce the amount of plastic you use. You have to recycle more. You have to reduce waste. Um, it's much easier for the government to put pressure on industry. But, of course, industry will, will buy their way out of these problems. I don't think today people are the blockers. We, really, what, what we need today is from the government strong signal, strong uh, incentives on, on, on the industry, the brands, the producers, uh, the waste management industry to really invest and, and, and do that, deliver that. Um, Matt, thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, you rock, man. Um, as a, a, a Shreproid, <laughs> Shrep, American, uh, I just wanted to thank you for always keeping me in the loop of British politics. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for that support, and great to see you on the stream tonight. Hope you're very well. And give my regards to Americans. And please don't vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> I know you won't, but uh, please, America, don't vote for Donald Trump. Facilities like this end up having to sort out all our plastic waste. And they're very good at recycling things like hard plastic. It's milk bottles, drinks bottles. But when it comes to film plastic, plastic bags, crisp packets and the like, all of that has to be sent for incineration. Burning plastic waste has a carbon footprint similar to burning coal. No wonder Greenpeace wants plastics to pretty much disappear. At the moment, we're in the middle of really crucial negotiations for... A so, so this is a small thing. But I think it, it can have a massive impact. So, for example, in my, in my little town, uh, there's an ice cream shop, gelateria, as they say, as they call it in Italian. Um, there's an ice cream shop, and the cup is made of um, a, a biodegradable plastic. Sorry, the, the cup is made of a biodegradable paper, so you can throw it in the in the uh, in Italian say umido uh, <laughs> in, the, in the compost it can be composted and also there's a plastic cover so if you're taking it away if you're not going to have it there you they put a little plastic cover but the plastic is actually made from corn so it's a corn based plastic which is also biodegradable so it can be composted as well so why can't we use more and this is a plastic that you're not going to use again it's it's single use plastic so why can't we move in the direction of that why can't we um, force industry to, it, when it comes to single-use plastic like bags and stuff like this, make them out of corn that can be uh, biodegradable, but can be composted. UN Global Plastics Treaty, and we're asking the UK government to be show huge ambition, be a leader in ambition in securing a treaty. <laughs> so, so I just want to, uh, Mark says, okay, Thames Water, if you want to make the the Thames uh, <laughs> look like a Mattis Nicobar. <laughs> That's disgusting, um, but funny. Deliver a target for cutting plastic production. But binning plastic altogether could have unintended environmental consequences, according to new research. Switching from a plastic carrier bag to a paper bag leads to an 80% increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Emissions for pet food in a tin are around 70% higher than if it's in a plastic pouch. And an aluminium can of drink has a carbon footprint 50% higher than a plastic drinks bottle. This doesn't, of course, include the impact of plastics on the marine environment or microplastics on human health, but hints at a future for the right kind of plastic. Exactly. It's not so much about moving from plastic to aluminium or plastic to paper, but plastic to a, a type of biodegradable plastic, I think, is a good way to go. Um, Liz, Liz just recycles the same kind of talking points. So she's doing her bit for the environment. Um, but Bajos was once described as a sack of custard in his rights. <laughs> to his rights. <laughs> Um, hemp can also make plastic. That's a very good point, uh, Nicholas. Yes, it can. Makes a very good uh, type of plastic. And you know, a lot of these things can be reused and um, and and if they're biodegradable. Um, I use canvas uh, tote bags when I when I shop. Take your canvas bags to the supermarket. And I don't know if anyone knows that song. <laughs> um, Axis of awesome. Um, love the fives. My brother is uh, is. I don't understand that, uh, Queen's Ferry. Um, maybe use a, a carrot over a stick. I hate the, the idea of a tax. Yeah, um, 
for for it to use biodegradable plastic i don't like this idea um look i, I don't maybe maybe give an incentive yeah it could be like a tax cut if you um look say to industry if you move to using biodegradable plastic we will cut your taxes and um, if you continue to use regular plastic you're going to have to pay a higher rate of tax so it could be something like that as you said you know what but um, industry industry can be can be moved by government you know we as individuals have let very little impact on industry but you know we can do it through campaigns and stuff like that but government has massive influence over industry because they write the legislation so i think we need to put pressure on government instead of trying to put pressure on industry Anyway, guys, we're almost at the industry and I want to say thank you so much to everyone who came on tonight. Thanks to the new people who've come on to the live stream as well. Hope you like the, the new format and you like the hat. The hat has a, a life of its own. <laughs> um, before we finish, we have our one for the road. Make sure to check out the, the live stream on Friday. Same bad time, same bad channel. But before we go, we have our funny video before we finish. Uh, two, two friends of the Sunday Roast in, appear in this. I hope you can identify them. There you are. Hello. No, over here. Oh. A little bit more to the right. Now you're speaking my language. So sorry, I didn't have anybody here to do my hair for me, or show me where the computer was, or how to turn it on. Right. Or how to use Zoom. Well, you're here now. Oh, I think you've frozen, Liz. Huh? So, should we get started? I'm sure you're very excited you've decided to publish my book. Well, that was actually my predecessor, but... Uh, I can't believe I've finally written a book. Yet another achievement for little old Lizzie. Successful foreign secretary, record-breaking prime minister, best-selling author... Well, we haven't published it yet. Oh, think positive, Mark. I can't see any way that this won't be a massive success. Can't you? No. Hmm. I just wanted to check a few passages with you, uh, if that's all right, just to check that you're okay with everything before we send it off to the printers. Okay. So, the bit where you talk about the death of Her Majesty the Queen. Awful day. Yeah. I had so many plans and poof, suddenly there was a funeral to arrange. Yeah, there's this whole paragraph where you say how annoying it was. You actually use that word. It was annoying and inconsiderate and actually quite rude. You've also got this whole section on Chevening, which reads like a bad TripAdvisor review. Well, the phone signal was dreadful. I was trying to have secure phone calls hanging out the window. Couldn't that be seen as a bit of a national security threat? Telling our enemies that when the Foreign Secretary's at Chevening, they're basically incommunicado. How dare you! I was wearing pants! What? I wasn't going incommunicado! Do you mean going commando? Listen here, Clive. I'm a big supporter of our armed forces. Did you know I once drove a tank? Off a cliff? Look, is there anything else you need, Simon? Because I've got a speech at a think tank later on and I need to rehearse my route from the stage to the door. The title. Ten years to save the West. I thought you liked it. Yeah, it's more this subtitle you've added. Why I'm right and everyone else is wrong and how being Prime Minister is jolly hard, actually. So why can't everyone just back off? Too subtle? We might not have space on the cover. Save it for the paperback. Oh god, the paperback. Although, then it would have to be nine and a half years to save the West. Which I actually think sounds better, don't you? <laughs> so guys, have a great week. I'll see you on Friday, same bad time, same bad channel. As always, stay safe, take care, good night.